Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. I think we'll uh, we will um, uh, we'll, we'll get started, but I have a feeling there'll be some more people uh, signing on. Before I introduce, first of all, good evening, everyone. It's good to see uh, all the, uh, the faces that I see and uh, and uh, and the names. It's uh, again, it'll be a wonderful opportunity not just to you know learn something this evening, but again to to stay connected as always. Uh, before I introduce uh, our speaker and uh, and the topic. I just first of all want to uh, recognize and thank the sponsors of the talk tonight. Uh, tonight's talk is being sponsored very generously by Naomi Colton, Leah Nyasi Marufka, and Miriam and Elad Arnon. And they're sponsoring it in memory of their husband and father, Abe Colton, Avraham Ben Yaakov, Aryeh Alva Shalom, whose yard site was on Rosh Chodesh Shvat, may his neshama have an aliyah, and we joined them in that uh, wish and tefillah, and uh, we thank them very much for the sponsorship. Um, our speaker tonight, we welcome this evening in our Tuesday night uh, speaker series, Mr. Menachem Butler, who is the program coordinator for Jewish law projects at the Julius Rabinowitz Program on Jewish and Israeli Law at Harvard Law School. He's also a contributing editor at Tablet Magazine and a co-editor at the Sfarim blog. And he has served as scholar in residence uh, and taught in uh, various venues across the country, the world, sharing his original uh, research. And uh, he also is a, a neighbor of ours. He lives across the river in Cambridge. And uh, also it's a pleasure for me as he is a dear old friend. The topic tonight is Rabbi Jonathan Sachs and his mentor, Rabbi Nachum Rabinovich, their relationship in earliest writings. Um, everyone I know is familiar with Rabbi Sachs. Perhaps not everyone is as familiar with his mentor, who is also a great uh, Torah scholar and leader and teacher, Rabbi Rabinovich. And that will be something that uh, if you have not heard of him, I'm glad that you're here tonight to learn about him from, uh, from Menachem. Menachem will discuss the relationship between this student and mentor, between Rabbi Sachs and Rabbi Rabinovich. And uh, we will look at some of their earliest writings and how their relationship and their own ideas and scholarship developed. And Menachem will also uh, share, um, besides for his original research into them, uh, some personal uh, stories and anecdotes, especially with Rabbi Sachs. Before I turn it over to Menachem, we have a number of very special guests who are joining us tonight. And uh, I hope I don't, I don't miss anyone. But um, uh, first of all, I think I saw Roy Butler's Roy Butler Menachem's father at least earlier, before we we filled up the screen, and uh, I believe also there are members of Rabbi Rabinovich's fi family here tonight, including his daughter. Uh, I think I also saw Mr. Nathan Lewin. We welcome as well, and uh, uh, Menachem will welcome any of the other special guests that that perhaps I may have missed. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Menachem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rabbi Hellman, for that kind introduction, and thank you to the sponsors for tonight's program. It's good to be back with friends at the Young Israel Brookline, just across the river. The funeral of a great leader is often when, when admirers hear of their accomplishments, uh, the famous episodes, and also the little known facts of, uh, of a scholar or a rabbi's life. The passing this year of so many of our community's senior rabbinic, intellectual, and spiritual leadership leaves a vacuum that has previously never been experienced by American Orthodox Jewry as a whole. Whichever community within the Orthodox community one finds it themselves in, there has been a loss in, in, in leadership. Rabbi Norman Lamb, the Novi Minsk Rebbe, Rabbi Yaakov Perlo, Rabbi Gedali Dov Schwartz, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Rabbi Edin Steinsaltz, former Sephardic Chief Rabbi, Rabbi Eliyahu Bakshi Daron, Rabbi Nachum Rabinovich, and most recently, Rabbi Yehuda Kellimer. In my brief remarks this evening, I, I wanna share some reflections on the passing just of two of these rabbinic figures, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs and his mentor, Rabbi Nachum Rabinovich. Though each of those whom I've mentioned and others are deserving of many hours of study and reflection. As a community, I'm confident that our institutions, schools, publications, and shuls will continue to study the writings and teachings of these figures and live our, communi our communal lives along the course of study of how they introduced. My talk is not, mentioned, is not meant to serve as an exhaustive look at the lives of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs and Rabbi Nachum Rabinovich. I won't be focusing on all of their communal activities, controversies, and criticisms. 
but I rather plan to focus on describing the start of their own journeys with a look at some of their earliest writings and how their ideas developed in their scholarship. I only met Rav Nachum Rabinovich once, though I have learned through many of his own svarim and published writings. The only time that I met him was over Shabbat of Parshat Zachar in 2009, when I was his guest at his yeshiva, Berkat Moshe and Malaya Dumim. The first thing that struck me when I saw him on Friday night during davening in the Beit Midrash was seeing an 80-year-old Torah scholar, the man who delivered many shiurim a week to students in a Hezder yeshiva, the author of a running commentary on Maimonides' Mishnah Torah, author of dozens of essays of Jewish thought and theology, Sifre Halacha of Shelot Chuvot for within the religious Zionist world, a man with doctoral and postdoctoral degrees in math and taught at the university level. But that's not what I saw. What I saw was a Rosh Hashiva who was also the candy man. All throughout the evening, the children in Malaya Dumim, the kids of the Talmidim and the Kolel and others would line up and receive a blessing for Shabbat from Rav Rabinovich and receive a candy. Rabbi Nachum Rabinovich, or Rabinowitz, depending on if you're talking to somebody who knew him from when he was in Montreal, was born in Montreal in 1928. He attended public school as a child. And shortly after his bar mitzvah enrolled at Montreal's Yeshivat Merkaz HaTorah under the tutelage of Rabbi Elia Chazan. However, Rabbi Elia would soon leave to New York and became a Rebbe at Torah Vadas. And in those years, it's weird to say, young Nachum, Rabbi Rabinovich, had chavrusas with European-born Torah scholars, older individuals, who had stopped in Montreal on the way to America. However, in 1944, a young Rabbi Nachum Rabinovich began learning with his Chavrusa, a boy who was also Montreal born, who was also a Montreal born student like him. And in a conversation, in a conversation recently with this Chavrusa, he told me how they learned together in the base Madrash of Merkaz Torah for the next four years. During those years, they studied under the tutelage of Rav Pinchas Hirschsprung, all the while going to university at night. Rabbi Rabinovich received his smicha from Rav Hirschsprung, and in 1948, after graduating college, Rav Nachum Rabinovich received a full scholarship to study mathematics in graduate school at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. His chavrusa told me that Rav Nachum only applied to graduate schools that would be near yeshivas, so that he can continue his own learning, and upon in, and, and therefore upon in, upon arriving to Baltimore, Rav Nachum enrolled at Neri Israel Rabbinical College, Neri Israel, and he became a prized disciple of its Rosh Hashiva. Rav Yaakov Ruderman. To the best of my knowledge, Rav Nachum Rabinovich was the only Neri Israel student who studied in college during the day and at the yeshiva in the evening. Three years later, Rav Ruderman arranged a shidduch between his niece and Rav Nachum, and Rav Nachum was then part of the yeshiva family. In 1952, Rav Rabinovich and his family moved to Dallas, where he served as a congregational rabbi and was an active member in national rabbinic organizations. As well, he convened somewhat of a fraternity of Orthodox rabbis in the southern part of the United States. He was also probably the only member of the national rabbinate like this, but he was also a lecturer in mathematics at Southern Methodist University, according to the newspaper reports, and participated in brotherhood conversations under the auspices of the National Conference of Christians and Jews. One such meeting in 1953 was reported in the local newspaper, and that Rabinovich emphasized, quote, we are all children of God. A few years later, in 1955, Rabinovich and his family moved to Charleston, where in under just one year, he led a building campaign of the shul and established an all-day Jewish day school, where he himself would serve as a principal. His daughter, who's on this call this evening, told me that for a time, Rav Nachum was the official rabbi who had traveled to Atlanta prior to Passover, and was responsible for the kosher for Passover certification of Coca-Cola. Continuing an earlier tradition established by Atlanta's Rabbi Tobias Geffen. Uh, can I jump in Menachem? First of all, my, mo my mother's here, so she's Chef Menachem. And also people should feel free to ask questions You know, when there's a break. You can raise your hand or just jump in. Menachem would, would appreciate that. All right, continue Menachem, thank you, sorry. Rav Nachum would spend his days learning and teaching Torah in Charleston. And every few months during Sudash Lishit on Shabbos, would announce to his congregation that he had finished studying another Talmudic tractate in depth, and in 1962 published his first sefer, Hadari Tamar, which was a collection of the drashot that he delivered upon the completion of each Masechta and ultimately the entire Talmud. He was in his early 30s at the time he finished studying the entire Talmud in depth. 
He would regularly correspond with Rav Hirschsprung in Montreal and with Rav Henkin and Rav Moshe Feinstein in New York. There are a number of Chuvot published in Igris Moshe to Rav Nachum, including a famous responsum confirming Rav Nachum's approach to spelling the name Charleston on a get. I heard a number of years ago the report that Rav Moshe Feinstein would tell Rav Ruderman to shep Nachas of the work that his nephew, Rav Nachum, was doing in Charleston. Rav Nachum would deliver lectures at rabbinic conferences and serve as an editor of the RCA's rabbinic journal Hadarom periodical. At one uh, Torah Masar convention in the late 50s, Rav Nachum spoke about Charleston as an American shtetl and explained that the only way to inspire communities is, quote, for all of American Jewry to know, for every Jew, even in the remotest provincial town, for each of them to know that they're a living member of God's people. As well, a flourishing Torah life is possible for the individual only in the framework of a Torah community. The transmission of the Torah way of life to future generations is all but impossible, except in such a community setting. That same year, following the launch of the Russian Sputnik, Rav Nachum took a cue from many other American leaders who saw the space race as an opportunity to highlight their own communal strengths. Rav Nachum wasn't too impressed with how everyone was marveling at the intellectual brain power of the Russians, the Soviets, and instead encouraged those in his community to visit a day school class learning Chumash with Rashi, and how one then must marvel at the intellectual maturity required and actually attained by the children in this study. 1963, Rav Nachum moved to Toronto, we served at, where he served as a rabbi of a synagogue in Clanton Park. He earned a PhD in mathematics with a thesis, probability and statistical inference in ancient and medieval Jewish literature. And he taught mathematics at the university and he served with Rev Gedalia Felder on the Beit Din in Toronto. So Rav Nachum, the goal of all of his communal efforts was in the study of and teaching of Torah. And by the end of the 1960s, began to be approached by figures in England to take the helm of Jews College, a rabbinic institution that was responsible at the time for training England's rabbis under the auspices of the chief rabbi. He accepted the position, remained there until 1982 when he moved to Israel and became a co-roach yeshiva at Yeshivat Birkat Moshe in Malay Dumim, alongside Yitzchak Shilat and Rav Chaim Sabato, training generations of Talmud Chachamim who have also served in the Israeli army. Rav Nachum published Svarim of Halacha for his students and other soldiers, of how to balance the tensions that they might encounter during their military service. Rav Nachum also devoted extraordinary energies on writing his Yad Pshuta commentary on the Rambam's Mishnah Torah, as well as continuing to release Chuvot and essays of significance and impact of the for the religious Zionist and the modern Orthodox communities. Until his passing this past year in May 2020 at the age of 92, Rav Nachum was the most senior modern Orthodox halachic figure within our community. And whether one agreed with all of his conclusions or not, he was a halachic force to be reckoned with. In a 1986 essay, Rav Nachum diagnosed the apathy towards Torah study as, the biggest, as one of the biggest problems of our time. His suggestion to remedy this problem was that every single individual Jew and every Jewish organization must urgently order their priorities if Jewish history is to pass them by. Learning and teaching Torah at every level he wrote and to all Jews together with a profound commitment to and love for all without exception, these alone are the essential tasks upon which all of our energies must be concentrated. Everything else is secondary. It was this hashkafa of teaching Torah to all that could serve as a bridge to Rav Nachum's disciple, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. Born in 1948 to a traditionally observant London family, Jonathan Sachs did not attend formal Jewish educational institutions during his childhood. His great grandfather, was Rav Aryeh Leib Frumkin, a prominent Lithuanian rabbinic scholar who published the Siddur of Rav Amram Gaon at the end of the 19th century, and was also a founder of Petach Tikva. His great uncle, Professor Moses Siegel, was a Lithuanian-born Orthodox Bible professor who studied in London and Oxford, and would later become a professor of Bible at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. His, his great uncle would pass away when Jonathan Sachs was 20 years old. It was precisely in those years in the late 1960s that the intellectual tensions between Judaism and philosophy caused much um, uh, concern and debate and struggle for Jonathan Sachs as he was a, a college student in, in university. And it led him to read an important 1966 symposium uh, published by a commentary magazine and republished as a book called The Condition of Jewish Belief. I'm sure many people here have seen it. And um, in that volume, several dozen American rabbis and scholars from across the denominations dealt with the very issues that were perplexing this young college student in England. 
And so Jonathan Sachs decided to take a trip to America during the summer. And he made a trek around the country and to meet many of the people who um, wrote essays in this book, in this series. The two people who did not write essays in this book, but whom he would often describe in, that Rabbi Sachs would often describe in his lectures, whom he met during that visit, were Rabbi Joseph E. Soloveitchik and Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And from each of them, Rabbi Sachs developed a connection and gained inspiration and chizik from them. And in fact, it was Lubavitcher Rebbe who encouraged him to return to campus and to take an active role in spreading Judaism to all of those who were around him. Uh, about a year or two ago, I reached out to Rabbi Sachs and I asked him, and I'll discuss, uh, describe a little more of the relationship in a few minutes, but I asked him who else he had visited during this trip to America. Couldn't possibly be, he was spending two months uh, just going around the country. Who, who, were, who were these people? He mentioned Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Moshe David Tendler, I believe as well. He also met with Rabbi Eliezer Berkowitz in Chicago, with Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein in New York. We know that he met with him there. And one hopes that in the years ahead, as Rabbi Sachs's uh, personal correspondences and papers, which have since been deposited at the uh, Metropolitan Archives in London, as these documents become available to researchers and scholars, especially the papers covering his teenage years, travels to America, will hopefully learn more about this trip and the conversations that he had with these rabbis. Coming back to England, Rabbi Rabinovit, uh, Rabbi Sachs, Jonathan Sachs, becomes a rabbinical student at Jews College. As Rabbi Sachs would later write in a, uh, in a Jubilee volume in honor of Rabbi, of Rabbi Rabinovich, he says that he was privileged to learn with Rabbi Nachum for 12 years, first as his pupil, then as a colleague, and eventually as his, as his successor. He says it was in, he, Rabbi Nachum was in every sense in learning and teaching and character and midot, an intellectual breadth and moral courage a giant. He, say that, he says, I say this mindfully and without exaggeration, he said, before I came to the college, I had already been privileged to meet some of the most outstanding thinkers in the Jewish and secular world. He studied at Oxford and Cambridge. He had also met great Torah teachers and the leaders in America. Yet in depth and rigor and knowledge and in many branches of Judaism and clarity and integrity, Rav Nachum excelled them all. He said he never met anyone quite like him, not then and not since. When we think now about Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, we tend to think of him as the globe-trotting uh, rabbi, not only when he was chief rabbi, but as well in the 1980s and 1982, after he um, um, received his ordination and had served as a community rabbi in London, he came over to America. I believe some people on this call might have even been present when Rabbi Sachs delivered a uh, Prabha lecture at the Youngers of Brookline. Um, it would be interesting to know if anybody has memories about uh, what he spoke about, and, who else he might have met with uh, in Boston that week. Uh, but in the end, Rabbi Sachs went back to England and he served as a, a rabbi in another congregation, ultimately becoming the principal of Jews College. And under the auspices of Jews College, he opened, he established a rabbinic journal called Laela. And it was in this rabbinic journal in Laela, as well as in letters and articles in the London Jewish Chronicle from the 70s and 80s, that Rabbi Sachs would use as his platform to expand um, the London Orthodox Jewish community's understanding of what it means to be an Orthodox Jew. Every issue of Laela included articles, book reviews, reflections, meditations, interviews, and it was a real opportunity for members of the London community to feel part of a larger Orthodox community, and in particular, a modern Orthodox community. Rabbi Sachs, by the end of the 1980s, as a disciple of uh, uh, the then Chief Rabbi Lord Emanuel Jacobowitz, um, his prominence became more widely known and his, prestigious, his prestige grew. And in the early 1990s, Rabbi Sachs became the chief rabbi in 1993, a position that he served until 2013. After he stepped down in 2013, Rabbi Sachs would travel around the world and he would give lectures um, everywhere. Uh, he would give lectures in synagogues, he would give lectures in universities and communities and when Rabbi Sachs would come to a community, he wouldn't just come to a synagogue and deliver a lecture, or he wouldn't just go to a university and deliver a lecture. He would arrive to the community, speak in one venue, and then go to the other locations as well. For he felt that if there was one 
if there was one constituency that was not hearing him, it would have been a loss for the for his uh, travels to that community. I met Rabbi Sachs um, about 20 years ago. I, I first I met him about 20, a little over 20 years ago, and I wrote him a letter uh, when I was a student in Yeshiva in Israel uh, with Rabbi Hellman. Um, Rabbi Hellman was in the base measures learning, and I was sitting and writing a letter to Rabbi Sachs. Um, and, I, and I asked Rabbi Sachs, you know, what are the sorts of uh, what, what are the sorts of things somebody should focus on um, as they're studying in yeshiva? I'm guessing from the fact of how he answered me, he figured that I wasn't sitting with Rabbi Hellman, per se, in the yeshiva, in the base Madrash learning, Gemara, classical, Svarim. And he wrote me a beautiful note um, of really devoting one's time towards studying and um, connecting to teacher as a Selah Harav, he says, make, make a point of meeting people that you admire. As well, he developed an idea. He says, the third is, whatever you learn, try to discern the broad principles, not just the detail. That is particularly important in one who seeks to be a leader. A leader is often called on to take uncharted paths. Therefore, he needs to compass a strong sense of overall direction. He gives a number of examples of various Rishonim to study, as well as political theory to study. And when Rabbi Sachs uh, stepped down in 2013, he had more time to devote to traveling the world and to writing more of his books. It was quite famous that every August, Rabbi Sachs would um, uh, barricade himself at his home and he would really chart the course of what he was gonna write for the year. So much so, one time when I was visiting his family, in, I was visiting uh, Rabbi Sachs and as well as his wife, Lady Elaine Sachs, um, she told me that she actually takes his shoes away and doesn't let him walk out of the uh, walk out of the home when he's working on his writings. And he would plan the course of his writings for the year. And every year he'd say, "What approach? What am I going to think about this year? Am I going to focus about poverty in the community? Am I going to focus about what it means to be a member of British society?" And all of his volumes, which number close to forty volumes, a mix of divrei Torah, machshava, divrei Torah meaning essays and uh, meditations on the weekly Torah portion, as well as philosophical essays of rabbinic figures, as well as general um, uh, philosophic ideas that he had developed over the years. And in each of these volumes, he tried to approach a different aspect of the overall condition of what it means to be a Jew in the 21st century. However, I felt a number of years ago that people are kind of missing a part of Rabbi Sachs. And that, that part is the, uh, you know, the young Rabbi Sachs, um, the pulpit rabbi, the um, educator at Jews College. Um, ultimately, Jews College uh, has since folded. It's now known as the London School of Jewish Studies. They offer various uh, educational classes, public lectures. And it didn't turn into the institution that Rav Nachum Rabinovich had in been interested in developing it into, nor that Rabbi Sachs uh, was able to develop it into. And... Um, I figured maybe it would make sense to go back to reading his articles that he would write, that, that he wrote in those early years to see, you know, what really speaks to Rabbi Sachs? How did he write? So for that, um, I have a, a few items here. There was a, a book published in 1975 called The Bar Mitzvah Book, uh, a book edited by Rav Nachum Rabinovich. And uh, presumably this is a book to give to a Bar Mitzvah boy. Um, I guess in 1975, Bar Mitzvah boys were interested in essays by Martin Buber, Rabbi Emanuel Feldman, um, Bernard Malamud, uh, Jonathan Sachs, etc. And it's essays on philosophy and um, what it means to be a Jewish boy. And the essay that Rabbi Sachs wrote, which to the best of my knowledge, isn't really, uh, nobody really quotes this that often. Um, it's called The Philosopher's Way. And it's a real meditation on what it means to be a, uh, a philosophically oriented, observant Jewish person. And the people that he introduces us to are Philo, Maimonides, Judah Halevi, the classical works of the medieval Jewish philosophers. Makes sense. As well as Moses Mendelssohn, and the reform movement and the science of Judaism, not exactly uh, Franz Rosenzweig, Martin Buber, not exactly individuals that you would expect um, uh, this, uh, this rabbi or educator to be trying to inspire these disciples with. But you have to realize that in those years, in the early 1970s, Rabbi Sachs was still 
grappling and struggling between this tension, these poles of uh, his philosophy writing and his rabbinic writing. And then in 1976, there's a bit of a controversy. It wouldn't be the first. Actually, this might, actually might be the first, but it certainly wouldn't be the last that Rabbi Sachs was involved in uh, in London. Apparently, there was an article in the London Jewish Chronicle in November 1976 about the efforts of the Leo Beck College, the Reform Rabbinical Seminary in London, and of the efforts of outreach that they were making within the community and the students who were studying in its rabbinical seminary to be trained to become Reform rabbis. And there was a small little sentence, which I'm sure many people missed, uh, but it mentioned that Jonathan Sachs was serving as a lecturer at Leo Beck College. Now, there are a few things that are not good for business. If you want to be an Orthodox rabbi in London, certainly on the faculty of Jews College, potentially a future chief rabbi, teaching at a Reform Rabbinical Seminary is not one of those things. And so several weeks later, Rabbi Sachs writes a letter to the editor titled, the letter is Reform Not Valid. And he says, sir, orthodoxy cannot in principle accept reform as a valid interpretation of Judaism. The acceptance of traditional Jewish law is authoritative and the exterior must always stand in the way of formal recognition of, of reform Judaism. On the other hand, a reformed Jew is a Jew like any other. And with him is an individual, the orthodox may legitimately work, um, seek to communicate and to share with values of our religious heritage. And he goes on to explain that um, we should try to open up the world of learning to all fellow Jews. And then he says, I mentioned this because you reported in your news columns that as well as teaching at Jews College, I had been a lecturer at Leo Beck. He says, that is not true. This is not true. He says, two years ago, I agreed privately to learn with some individuals who were studying at Leo Beck College as part of the general obligation that I felt to spread Jewish learning, to spread Jewish knowledge to whoever wishes to learn. There was no lectureship. And this chavrus actually took place in Rabbi Sachs's home. It was not at Leo Beck College. He was not paid for it. He says, at no time, I was at no time a member of the teaching faculty of the college. And when a short time later, a report appeared in the paper that I had been appointed a lectureship, this miscommunication to a private relationship forced me immediately to discontinue it. Apart from wishing it set the record straight, apart from wishing to set the record straight, I must add my personal conviction and confusing the area of informal willingness to share traditional learning without a formal recognition of reformed Judaism does great harm to the cause of Jewish unity. And this was a, a tension that would return over and over and over during the 1980s when he's at Jews College, as well as in the 1990s when he became the chief rabbi. Jews College as um, uh, was at the time, they were dealing with um, the students who are themselves Orthodox, as well as the non-Orthodox members of the communities who are interested in more of an involvement in academic, um, in academic engagement with the institution. Several decades earlier, Rabbi Louis Jacobs was uh, fired as, uh, an edu as a, a, a professor there. He was perhaps gonna become the principal of Jews College. And it wasn't until the early 1980s that Rabbi Jonathan Sachs was the first member of the Orthodox community in London who actually responded to Rabbi Jacobs after 25 years since the start of the Jacobs affair. To the best of my knowledge, that essay as well has not really been explored by scholars. But the other essay that I want to just briefly mention is an is a article that Rabbi Sachs wrote in September 1970, in September 1976. And it was on the occasion of an anniversary of Jews College. And he wrote an autobiographical essay about his own journey and his own development as a, as a, as a student at Jews College and as a member of the Orthodox community, the confraternity in London. He says, coming to Jews College for the first time is like discovering a lost civilization in the heart of the West, West End. It is disconcerting at the same time symbolic that the center of Anglo-Jewish learning should be set neither in a pastoral seclusion nor embedded in Jewish suburbia, but exposed to the full tide of urban realities. The college I quickly realized was neither defensive nor introvert. That was my first surprise. He says, my second was that its image bore so little relation to its actuality. First encounters are dominated by pre, uh, preconceptions. 
I remember that before I went up to Cambridge for the first time, I had like every other undergraduate already built and populated the university in my imagination, the time mellowed courtyards, the cricket lawns, civilized repartee in the small hours. But of Jews College, what was there, what was there to guess at? The image that preceded it was not altogether encouraging. He continues on as saying that ultimately at Jews College, he says, I came to Jews College at the age of 25, not as old as Rabbi Akiva was when he began to study, but already past the age with which many yeshivot would regard a mind as salvageable, as salvageable from the ravages of a secular education. In my three years in the college, I've seen students come from half the countries of Europe, from Canada, the States, and Australia. He says, but it's, he says the consequence of a belief that Jewish learning is open to all who are willing to recognize its challenge. He says, but we are not all members of a single sect. We have our Hasidim and our anti-Hasidim, our extremists and our moderates. But what unites us is simply the Torah in which we are engaged. He says, I had expected in passing Second, to find a narrow world, but he says ultimately he found one that was more intense. He says Anglo Jury, and he says it's important that Anglo Jury values this openness from within the college. And then he concludes by saying, we have within the college, we've been living these tensions these past few years of excitement of change. There is a sense of a powerful new venture in Jewish education. It would be ironic if through the lack of public knowledge alone, the college failed to get the support it needs. It would be more ironic still if the same lack of knowledge kept us from the students who could best respond to the stimulus it provides. Rabbi Sachs at this point was moving up the ranks within the college and ultimately once Rabinovich would move to Israel, he would assume the position as the principal of Jews College. So if a person walks into a Barnes Noble or walks into a bookstore, there are many books that they'll read about Rabbi Sachs. There will be many books that they will read by Rabbi Sachs. They'll see the books that uh, were composed after 9-11, uh, after various forms of extremism and terrorism around the world, as well as books of interfaith growth and learning and um, education. And in his recent books, um, his belief of the, the appropriate usage of technology to spread the teachings of Torah, as well as if one would walk into, as well in, uh, for example, an Israel bookshop in Brookline, where one will also see those books uh, sold, one will also see his Divrei Torah and the essays on the Parsha and Machshava that Rabbi Sachs wrote and realizing that he was writing for a community of people that he felt were similar to him, str struggling with a lot of the same philosophic ideas of tensions between Judaism and philosophy and Rabbi Sachs wanted to create that literature. And in doing so, he would um, capture this content and, and uh, this Homer uh, from all of the ways that the, the works that he studied. And he would find a new way on how to teach it. Until the end of his life, Rabbi Sachs viewed himself as a Talmud Muvak of Rav Nachum Rabinovich. And in the memorial tribute for Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who passed away earlier this year, there was a video that was showed, uh, that, was, uh, that was played of um, when Rabbi Rabinovich stepped, uh, when Rabbi Sachs stepped down as chief rabbi in 2013, there was a video from Rabbi Rabinovich that was uh, shown. And in the video, Rabbi Rabinovich says that uh, many people refer to Rabbi Sachs as a rabbi, as a professor. He says, and with respect, he said, uh, with respect to the queen, even Lord, he said, but I remember him when he was a Talmud of mine who began uh, learning with him at Jewish College. And Rabbi Sachs uh, and Rabbi Rabinovich then points to um, something within the Gemara that there are a number of um, figures in the Gemara, Tanam and Amaraim, who are not known as rabbi, Hillel and Shammai, um, et cetera. And he says, because ultimately it wasn't about the stature that they were looking to attain, but it was rather the work that they did and their actions and the teachings that they taught. And he said, in that regard, he's like, that's how we ought to view the work of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. Um, ultimately, Rabbi Sachs was uh, uh, passed away um, quite young. He had literally had another 25 years worth of books to write. He would keep a list of every book that he's gonna write for the next number of years. Um, and, uh, you know, in thinking of when Rabbi Hellman invited me to speak tonight, 
he said, you know, why don't you share some thoughts about some of the people who were taken, who passed away this past year? I was thinking this might be an opportunity uh, to just take a different look at Rabbi Sachs. And hopefully, as we now read the writings of Rabbi Sachs, as well as those of Rabbi Rabinovich, we realize that at the core of what their whole effort was, uh, the effort ultimately was about uh, Torah study and inspiring people of the, uh, the, the magnificence of Judaism and of Torah teaching. And in that sense, um, they were both quite successful. And it might take a little while for people to catch up to read all those writings, um, but they left us an entire legacy uh, to read from. So thank you very much. Um, thank you, Menachem. Any, anyone would like to share a reaction, ask a question? about something that Menachem discussed, maybe something related, um, but wasn't touched on directly about either Rabbi Sachs or Rabbi Rabinovich. Just feel the free to unmute yourself and, and, and ask. So, yeah, was, uh, Menachem, thank you very much. That was very interesting and enlightening. Um, what was, uh, you, you read a part where um, uh, Rabbi Sachs uh, talk, talked about how the expectation of Jews College was different than Cambridge, Cambridge he knew he was getting himself into essentially, and at Jews College he, he apparently was different. What was it that he expected, if he, if you know from his writings or did he ever articulate it, that was different than the reality when he when he came there? I mean, he talks about an urban setting. I mean, what what exactly was the surprise, if you will, um, that he encountered when he got to Jews College? When people often discuss Jews College, they contrast it with a traditional yeshiva as well as with a traditional university setting. Jews College was neither like Yeshiva University or Bar Ilan University. It was a religious Zionist institution, but it wasn't uh, an institution of higher educational learning. At the same time, it wasn't a traditional Yeshiva. When Rabbi Sachs was studying at Jews College, he also studied in a local based Medrash, Rabbi, um, I think it was Rabbi Ordman, who he learned with him as well in London. Um, and that was a traditional Yeshiva. Jews College wasn't that either. I think that when Rabbi Sachs contrasts Jews College with Oxford and Cambridge, Oxford and Cambridge were the highest levels of a university setting. And there was some, my sense is there was some sort of um, uh, feeling that Jews College never really lived up to being the great educational, religious educational institution such that exists within the Torah world. And that ultimately a graduate of Jews College would not be able to be both in a high level Talmudic dialogue with a student in Panovich, as well as being engaged in conversation and in, in philosophical thought with a student in Oxford or Cambridge. And I think that's something that really bothered Rabbi Sachs. Um, there was a, a book published a few years ago about the history of Jews College and in the chapter about Rabbi Rabinovich and Rabbi Sachs, and then the subsequent chapter about Rabbi Sachs, they speak about the, 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 um, the frustration that they weren't able to find graduate students to leave university and then go to um, enroll in Jews College for the rabbinate. And they, there were a number of prominent scholars uh, who would ultimately go to Jews College. Um, one of the great scholars of uh, medieval Jewish history of the Cairo Geniza is Professor Stefan Reif. And he studied at the university as well as in Jews College. And he would write an article in 1993, uh, which really sums up the classic tension of Rabbi Sachs, titling it The Dilemma of Dr. Jonathan and Rabbi Sachs. And really how there was always this tightrope that he was either on one side or the other, but he was always trying to straddle this line that how would he be represented? And I think, uh, Rabbi Jack, to answer your question, one could not, at least in the way that Zeus College was structured at that time, be a major, um, member of the halachic community of, of, of high-level Torah learning and uh, producing high-level Torah scholarship, as well as also doing that at the university. There were individuals who did a little more one way, a little more the other way, um, but it would be interesting to see of the Dayanim who became appointed to the London Bethden in the second part of the 20th century, how many of them personally studied at Jews College uh, or versus where they came from other institutions, mainly uh, Haredi institutions in Israel, at Manchester Gateshead, as well as in America. I think, yeah. I think right, right, Pollock, do you have a question or comment? I have, I have, a, I have a comment. Um, I want to say a word. Um, I, I, knew, I did not know Jonathan Sachs very well, 
Uh, but I did know Rabbi Rabinowitz, and I'm very close uh, to his son, Mordechai, uh, who lives in Israel. Uh, I want to say a word about uh, the early days of Montreal, uh, as one who uh, put in my time there. Um, and uh, and uh, we both got smicha from the same from the same rub from Rabbi Hirschsprung. Montreal, um, people who were born in Montreal uh, prior to the Second World War, uh, who were from and who remained from, and they were a minority, um, were a very interesting group. They all were deeply committed and involved in Torah learning and everybody and at a very high level, at a, at a high yeshiva level. Um, and they all went to college. And this was, you have no idea what, an, I mean, I'm sure you do, what an anomaly this is. This is not yeshiva university. So Merkaz Atara, where uh, Rabbi uh, uh, Rabinowitz hung out and learned and where Rabbi Hirschsprung was at the time, the Rosh Yeshiva, uh, was a dive. It was a two-story house on St. Joseph Boulevard, um, uh, never clean, uh, and a base medrash full of passionate learners, all of whom, I, I dare say, all of whom were going to college at the same time, yet learning was the primary uh, <laughs> world that they lived in. So it was a very interesting concept. By the end of the 1940s and the beginning of the 50s, um, the Holocaust survivors started coming into the city. They came, survivors from Hungary, survivors from Poland, um, and also uh, a very interesting group of Russians, people that had uh, Chabadniks that were, that were not Polish, but were Russians. Uh, and they already started to change the culture. But when I was in high school in the 1950s, all the the boys that were born in Montreal and who came from from homes and who were passionate about Torah learning and went to the yeshivas, America's a Torah, Lubavitch, those were the two centers. Um, all of them went uh, to uh, college at night or college during the day and went to yeshiva at the same time. But it was a very different culture and that's the culture that Nachum Rabinowitz comes out of and it's not, it's not that well known. Uh, so I wanted to, uh, to put in that piece. Maybe we'll just leave it at that. Yes, uh, thank you, Rahab. Miriam. Um, just two pieces of trivia. Um, one is a story that Joyce Kozowski told a few, uh, right after Rabbi Sachs passed. Uh, she said that um, she and um, Bernie hosted the Sachses when they came on the Preba to Young Israel in the 1970s. And uh, she served, I guess it was a group of people, and she served her pull apart cake. And uh, Mrs. Sachs like didn't know what to do with it. She couldn't possibly pull the cake apart. It was, she said it was a, described it as a very awkward, awkward moment <laughs> at, at that Shabbos meal. Um, and the other thing, a, f a few people on this uh, show will remember that Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Novich's daughter Shoshana, who goes by Shansi, uh, was a graduate student in Cambridge in the, uh, I guess, 1980, early 80s, and met her husband, Yitzhak Klein, and they were married in Israel in 1982, and they came back to the Boston area, and they were young Israel members, and two, the first two children were born here. Wow, well, thank you. Yeah, those... That, that... It is very appropriate then that this uh, talk is tonight being held at the Youngsdorf Brookline. And uh, your comment reminds me of a, another story. When I was uh, in 2009, I was visiting with Rabbi Sachs at his home and he was telling me about some of the work that he's doing and how you know, he's halfway through the year, he still has his deadlines and he had to keep to his deadlines. He had to write his articles and the op-eds and the books. And he said, you know, and also I have to continue my um, um, 
hosting various uh, events and it was very difficult. He said, you know, Shabbos meal takes a long time. You have these people coming over and you have to talk and you have to devote your full attention to them. He said, for example, next Friday night, the Archbishop of Canterbury is coming for Friday night dinner. And you know, <laughs> Shabbos is gonna start at a certain time and we're gonna have to go through everything. And I said, Rabbi Sachs, uh, I could extend my ticket and stay for another week. And he said, I'm sorry, but you weren't invited. And I said, well, okay, you know, I guess, I guess can't invite myself to that Shabbos meal. But for Rabbi Sachs, those meals were very important because that's how he developed the one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, connections. And I see Rabbi Nechemia is on the, on the, the call, definitely the panim al panim, the real frontal face-to-face -face dialogue for Rabbi Sachs was very important. It wasn't about bringing somebody to the other, to his side to see how he sees the world, but really to be able to see the other person. And Rabbi Sachs utilized the Shabbos meal as a way of doing that. Um, another thing about Rabbi Sachs that was very significant that people have uh, discussed since his passing was his love of music. Not that he was a good singer, and I believe he even would say publicly that he wasn't a good singer, but he saw that for many of the young Jewish students in England who were not students in Jewish schools, for them to learn Jewish music and Jewish songs and to gain a solidarity with other Jews, as well as with Israel, was a very, very powerful uh, form of communication, a form of education. And he would travel with different chazanim from the different the cantors from the different you know, high church British synagogues. And they would go around England. And once a year, they would go to Israel and they would travel around. And this is like another way of Rabbi Sachs realizing there's some way to reach people. And if this is going to work for them, I have to go that way. Um, yeah. Uh, I, you didn't talk at all about his tenure at the uh, uh, synagogue in, in London, I, I remember being there uh, for two services when during professional visits to London. And in particular, I remember him making a point by co quoting Groucho Marx. Uh, it was a privilege to be at least at services in the uh, was it Marble Arch, Marble Arch Synagogue. He didn't, I don't know how long he was there, but I visited that synagogue in two different years. And it was an opportunity to hear him personally, which I valued. Right, Marble Arch was the second synagogue that he was the rabbi of. The first one was um, it's called uh, Dunstan Road in Golders Green, and then in Marble Arch. Um, and a number of years ago, I was in um, Golders Green for a Shabbos, and I met a number of the old timers in the community who remembered Rabbi Sachs. They, they still knew Rabbi Sachs, and they remembered when he was a rabbi in their congregation. And um, I, you know, I often wonder what it was like for him to return to that community where they remembered when he first started delivering sermons. And we don't have copies of those sermons that he uh, gave in those earlier years. Um, I'm sure Groucho Marx was not the first Marx that Rabbi Sachs had encountered in his <laughs> studies. Um, and it was, it, it was a um, struggle for him. And he describes this, and actually Diane Ivan Binstock in his hespit for him at the funeral mentions that in Rabbi Sachs's earliest writings, when he was in the university, he was very uh, philosophically oriented. He was very, um, it was difficult writing. And when you look at it now, you say, what you, Rabbi Sachs is so uh, accessible. And, you know, he would open up the times, you know, on a Sunday morning in London, and you would read what Rabbi Sachs writes of, of a, a short machshava related to tzedakah or, or chesed or some of the way that he's teaching to the world. I'm just reminded also, um, in 1975, um, uh, Rabbi Sachs uh, presented a lecture at the Association of the Orthodox Jewish Scientists, of which his rabbi, Rav Nachum Rabinovich, was a, uh, one of the leaders of. And uh, 1976, a book comes out, a volume. And again, for, somewhat foreshadowing the later experiences that Rabbi Sachs would encounter uh, during his um, tenure as chief rabbi. So he writes an article entitled Philosophy in the Language of Religion. Presumably this was based on a uh, philosophy paper that he wrote at, in college or graduate school. And it's Dazzling and Kant and Hegel and Mendelssohn and Hermann Cohn, Franz Rosenzweig, etc. Plato, Aristotle, Hume, Leibniz, Spinoza, Descartes, everybody. That's just on the first page, in a certain way, reflective of the first few pages of Rav Salvechik's Halachic Man. And in the footnote, there's a, uh, a little note. Dr. Jonathan Sachs is a lecturer in philosophy at Jews College in London. His article entitled Philosophy in the Language of Religion sparked some heated debate among members of the editorial board and consultant reviewers. 
We have elected to publish Dr. Sachs's paper in its original form, but must point out that the views expressed are solely those of the author and do not necessarily represent those of the AOJS. So already in the 1970s, Sachs was getting pushback from others within the community. And these were people who were even willing to read his writings, as opposed to the later controversies where some people um, uh, who, let's say, weren't regular readers of his writings and weren't accustomed to his style of writing and his form of quoting and his ideas. And he ultimately had to reissue some work. Um, but it was even within the community where he identified that was a little hesitant about it, but they never pushed him out. And he was always within the fold. And um, yep, and it's, it's another one of those writings, which there's a student at Harvard Law School now who's uh, going to be working on a paper about this, um, this essay from 1975 about Rabbi Sachs's philosophical, philosophic position. I understand that he went back for one week each year to, to uh, Marble Arch for many, many years, even to, to, towards the end of his life. He would always go back for one week each year to Marble Arch for one Shabbos. Yeah. He loved, Rabbi Sachs would often tell me how he loved going, first of all, to Marble Arch, but also to the different synagogues throughout England. He said he doesn't, he, he knew that he, the role of the chief rabbi is not just to be, you know, the rabbi only in Marble Arch or only in the, you know, the, the big synagogues, uh, so much so that his uh, successor, uh, Rabbi Fry Mervis, uh, took this to the next level and made sure that over the course of, I think, every three years, he would visit every single congregation that's under the auspices of the United Synagogue. And that really to try to uh, educate and inspire and to hear the needs and the, the concerns that existed in the small communities all around the country, all, all around England. And in a certain sense, I think that also is continuing what Rev. Rabinovich um, wrote in the 1950s um, in, when he was in Charleston. You know, Rabinovich could have stayed in Baltimore. He married the Rosh Hashiva's niece. He could have been the next Rosh Hashiva of Nair Yisrael in Baltimore. Um, but he chose to go to uh, first he went to Dallas and then he went to Houston. Um, and um, I'm not sure if it was after Houston or if it was after Charleston, or if it was after Charleston. Um, maybe uh, if his daughter Toby can just clarify this, that he was offered to be uh, the chief rabbi in uh, South Africa, but that he felt, Rabinovich felt that he couldn't in good ethical conscience uh, live somewhere under apartheid. And so he then went to Toronto and when he was in Toronto, his, uh, his Chavrusa told me that when it came time to go to England, he said, oh, England, it's one step closer to Eretz Israel, And the flights are going to be shorter to Eretz Israel." And after a decade or so in England, he then went to Eretz Israel. And it's when you look at, you know, I, I can imagine that, that one can wonder whether there were three different N.L. Rabinoviches. There was a Nachum Rabinovich, there was a Nachum Rabinovich, there was a professor, there's all these different people. You know, in 2004, there was one of the anniversaries of the Rambam, which uh, they say it's a segula for Yamim, for a professor of medieval Jewish philosophy to live to one of the anniversaries of Maimonides, either of his birth or of his death. And Rav Rabinovich delivered um, a series of lectures, both within the traditional rabbinic uh, circles about the significance of the Rambam and within the academic circles about the Rambam. I believe he was the only person who was able to literally go to the two different conferences in the same year. And Rabinovich saw himself uh, in the tradition of the Rambam as the scientist, as the philosopher, as the doctor of mathematics. Um, and, um, um, and, and he really saw in, in the Rambam a, a real mentor. And ultimately he devoted his, his life to writing a, his parish on the Rambam. Thank you. Any last question or comment? I also want to share anything or ask anything. Menachem, I don't want to put you on the spot. Can you think of one more? It could just be a small little nugget, personal uh, anecdote, interaction. Um, Sorry, I don't with, want to put you on the you spot. Know, with Rabbi Sachs, again, I only had the opportunity to meet with Rabinovich that one time that Shabbos. And, and it was just the stark contrast of the Hezri Yeshiva, of seeing the 80-year-old Rosh Yeshiva, that, that was like enough. I don't know if I'd be able to handle more than that with him because it would just overwhelm me. But um, um, Rabbi, Rabbi, Lan, uh, Rabbi, um, Rabbi Sachs. We can have you back another time, Nachman. Also, no, 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 just, uh, second. Um, I, I remember that when Rabbi Sachs delivered um, 
so a- after after um, after Rabbi Sachs stepped down as chief rabbi, he spent time at Yeshiva University and at NYU in New York. And he would come to New York, and he was he, he lived by his schedule. You know, one day a week he'd be at Yeshiva, one day he'd be at NYU, uptown, downtown. And I had coffee with him one down one day down at NYU because I figured it would be easier to meet with him because all the students at NYU were on the same class schedule, and he therefore had empty time during the day. Whereas uptown at Yeshiva University, uh, we made our own schedule for classes. Um, and it, it was harder to find a time for him. So I had coffee with him one day and I, I was trying to think of what could I give Rabbi Sachs, you know, to welcome him, you know, to New York for the year. And I walked in with the Ezra's Torah Luach. I said, Rabbi Sachs, you're now in America. You have to know the Zmani Tefillah for America and what time Shabbos starts and a different uh, Minhagim. This is not England. This is not Minhag Anglia. This is very... So he looks, he's like, oh, I've heard about this for years. He said, years ago, I used to get this every week, every year. He says, now I'm not able to get it. He's like, I'm going to put this into my talus bag. And every Shabbos, I'll think of you uh, when I look to see what time, you know, Shabbos starts and Shabbos ends. I, I just felt like that was, was a very nice uh, thing that he said. And um, yeah. Was- That's great. That's great, Malachi. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Menachem. We learned about two uh, great people uh, this uh, this evening. And I'll just, before we close, I'll thank again the sponsors and uh, Naomi Colton, Leon Yossi Marufka, and Miriam Enalad are known. I believe I saw uh, them on and uh, they're sponsoring in memory of their husband and father, Abe Colton, Avram Ben Yaakov, Arye Allah Vashalom, whose year it was on Rosh Chodesh Shabbat. And we thank them very much and Shabin Aliyah for his neshama. If uh, anyone uh, has any further questions for Menachem, uh, if you don't have his email, I'll make sure to get it to you um, uh, and you can continue the conversation. All right, Yashikov, thank you very much everyone for participating. Good evening, have a great night.